saving money never sounded better. Once again, from Billings, Montana, Sam Donaldson. Now a story that makes good on a primetime promise. We told you in March that Jay Shadler would be traveling the country, hitting the road, if you will, in search of adventure. And tonight he brings us the story of a man who followed his dream right to the top of a snow-covered mountain. He took Jay along for one extraordinary ride, not in a car or truck, but in a rather unconventional way of getting around. So many people march to somebody else's drum, not their own. I march to my own drum. Oh boy, this is great, sure. Coming into some rough stuff here. Whoa, gee. For Norman Vaughn, the fountain of youth is a frozen lake. Nice boy, they did that well. Good dog, the boy did that. Yeah. And a team of dogs stretched out in the shadow of Alaska's Mount McKinley. Nice dog. I'm 89 going on 40. There's a lot of folks who are 40 going on 89, you know that? <laughs> Hitching a ride with a legend could be a bit daunting if it weren't Norman driving the sled. He drove one for Admiral Byrd in the Great Antarctic Expedition of 1928. In World War II, he led dog teams on a rescue mission that saved 24 American airmen. And he's the oldest man to ever run Alaska's grueling Iditarod race. Norman Vaughn, 84 years young and getting ready for another 1,000-mile trek. Up here, everybody knows Norm. Thank you. All right. Hey, Jerry Austin. Hey, Norm. Will you sign my book for me? Yeah, I'll sign your book. Sure. You got a pen? When you want to do something, you dream about it. Dream doesn't mean go to sleep and wake up with a dream. It means wanting to do something so badly that you'll sacrifice everything to get it done. These are rough-looking mountains, aren't they? Yeah, they are. On a 7,000-foot glacier in Alaska's Denali mountain range, we began retracing the footsteps of an explorer's life, from a privileged childhood to his first crossroads in college. You dropped out of Harvard. Yes, I voluntarily just said goodbye. Never went back? No. <laughs> it was 1927. Commander Richard E. Byrd was planning an expedition to the South Pole. Exploration in the South Polar region will always be hazardous. Commander Byrd needed a sled dog trainer. Norman wanted an adventure. No American had ever been to the Antarctic before. And here was one of my heroes going, and there was a bare, bare chance that I could go with him. So I gambled everything, a year of my life and no pay. Ever the finagler, Norman coaxed two of his college buddies, Eddie Goodale and Freddie Crockett, to join in his bargain with Bird. Late that fall, they set sail for the Antarctic on the great clipper ship, the city of New York. And when it came time to go through the ice pack, I volunteered to sit in the crow's nest with the ice pilot. And that's a pretty small barrel, and I was up there for 36 hours. Spotting your way through the ice? Yes, yeah, spotting your way through the ice. On Christmas Day, 1928, the expedition landed on Antarctica and soon established the first American base camp on the continent. Ten months later, Norman and five others were picked to travel into the interior, in position to rescue Byrd if his plane went down during its historic first flight over the South Pole. I saw Admiral Byrd go into unknown territory because he sent us. I was one of them. That was exciting in itself, just to think that you were stepping on land, on rocks, that had never been seen before by anybody. Norman's footprints were now stamped on this strange white world. His name was about to be etched here too. For when the expedition ended, Admiral Byrd rewarded Norman and his two trusted friends with a monumental gift. And as I remember it, the three of us went together. No one was there except Admiral Byrd. And he said, you fellas, uh, I, I've named a mountain for you. <laughs> we didn't know what to do with it. You had no idea. No idea. But I did say, gosh, I thanked him and said, I've got to go down and climb it. I read somewhere where Admiral Byrd told you, give up this adventuring life, you should go into business. Oh, yes, he did. I didn't follow those suggestions. <laughs> Why not? Here, because I couldn't. I couldn't keep in business when I didn't like it. There's only one life. So I said, We've, I've got to keep going, and that's what I'm doing. 
What did you have to give up to be an adventurer? Living closely with my family, I think. With my children, I'm thinking of them. I didn't give them enough time. I slighted them by being an adventurer. And there were other tolls to be paid. Three marriages collapsed. A snowmobile business failed. His daring spirit was withering in a nine-to-five world. Having touched such a bright dream as a young man, he lived in its shadow as he grew older. At the age of 68, alone and broke, Norman came to another crossroads. He bought a plane ticket to Alaska and moved into the YMCA. I put a hundred dollar bill in my, between two socks in my shoe, but I, and swore to myself I wouldn't pay it, use it. Would have, of course, I was gonna die, but that's all, and I never did. Hello, fellas. I had a nice dog. But at least life was an adventure again. He returned to what he knew best, loved the most. Hell, boy. Training dogs. Thirteen times he ran them in the granddaddy of all sled dog races, the Iditarod. Then in 1985, at age 80, he traveled to a reunion in Atlanta. And suddenly these three ladies came to the table, and they were all about the same age, all good-looking, and I just w flipped. <laughs> <laughs> so did Carol and Moogie, 37 years younger than Norman. At first, it was like, God, why? I mean, this is awful. I'm attracted to an 80-year-old man. I mean, the, and the age discrepancy was so great. And um, it was like we were in a time warp. This has to be one of the classic pickup lines of all time. And I quote, I need a dog handler. Can you come up to Alaska? <laughs> <laughs> so it worked. Yes. <laughs> Gathered together before these witnesses to join this in man. In fact, it worked so well, just a year later, on New Year's Eve, Norman and Carolyn were married in Trapper Creek, Alaska. For better or worse. We'd had a huge big dump of snow, so 200 people came by dog team and snow machine. It was a wonderful Alaskan wedding. <laughs> Newlyweds on snowmobiles. They cut quite a figure sliding into their one-room cabin with no electricity or running water. It's already lit. Water's on. But in these deep woods, an old dream and a new adventure began. Could Norman, with Carolyn's help, return to the Antarctic and finally climb that mountain Admiral Byrd had named for him six decades ago? Took you a few years. Sixty-five <laughs> before I got started. She now had the dream as we were getting ready. She wanted to do it as much as I. It was like we were soulmates because we both had this love of adventure and always had had adventure in our soul and in our hearts. And neither one of us had had anybody else in a relationship who understood that. But two years of intense preparations ended in disaster in 1993 when the cargo plane carrying their dogs, supplies, and a few team members crashed on the Antarctic ice. The expedition veterinarian was badly injured, four dogs lost, and the dream shattered. Yet being a man familiar with the lost and found department of dreams, Norman started over again. And just a year and a half ago, three days before his 89th birthday, the old man met his mountain, all 10,302 feet of it. The trek up was steeper than I'd expected, and I think more taxing on me. What were the weather conditions? Very, very windy, and uh, temperature up at the top about 15 or 20 below zero. And with the wind, that's suffering gold. Accompanied by Carolyn, two mountaineers, and a National Geographic film crew sponsoring the trip, Norman had one last chance to scale his namesake. I had to say to myself, one step at a time, and every step is closer. How many steps total? 7,129 steps. To the top of Mount Vaughan. That's right. I'm almost at the top. I was now in the lead of the group, and I felt this was the climax. And that was uh, very powerful. I got up to the top, and I looked around, and then looked back at Carolyn, and uh, then I grabbed her and kissed her. 
And I thought that was wonderful. Wow. <laughs> On top of the world? Yes. Top of the world for me. Or should I say bottom of the world? We had worked so hard for so long and come through so much. Then to finally be there, it was almost like it wasn't real. As we stood on the top of the mountain and we looked out toward the Ross Ice Shelf, I could see Norman and Eddie and Freddie and Ghoul, the whole geological party. You could see them down there. 1928. Their right. He looked up at me and he said, I can't imagine being in a better place in the whole world than right here, right now. You're a lucky man, Norman. What are you thinking about? How lucky I am. Hello. Welcome to Mount Colonel Vaughn. Wow. These days, Norman likes to share a bit of his luck with kids. And to fail. Seven decades after he dropped out of school, he occasionally drops back in with the lesson of his life. Dream big and dare to fail. Norman and Carolyn Vaughn have begun escorting people to the North and South Poles, and they plan to run an annual river rafting trip in Alaska. You can read more about the further adventures of Norman Vaughn in his recent book, My Life of Adventure. We'll be right back. We're gonna have a party. His enormously popular love songs landed him center stage until a sudden and mysterious absence kept him out of sight for a decade. At the time of our broadcast, the companies told us that what we found was not typical and that they would look into it. And here's what happened when they did. Denny's hired new management at its Nashville store and developed a new food safety training program for franchisees. Pizza Hut replaced the manager of the store where we worked and renovated the kitchen. Wendy's dispatched its own team of quality assurance experts to all Wendy's in the Nashville area. As for Shoney's, they wrote us a letter in which they said our report served as a wake-up call. The chairman sent 2,200 managers to a training course in food handling and safety. And in the last week, the Nashville Health Department told us sanitation levels at all the facilities where we worked have greatly improved. And in New York, the day after our story aired, Dunkin' Donuts closed that Smithtown store. Dunkin' Donuts in Riverhead has closed, renovated, and reopened under new owners last month. A breaking story at the Freeman compound. Sam Donaldson will have the latest developments, live from Montana. And meet a remarkable man who conquered a mountain and waited 65 years to finally live his dream. Primetime Live, brought to you by... Giga Ranch. This afternoon, federal agents escorted the last miner, 16-year-old Ashley Dudley, off to the nearby FBI command post. Ashley has been placed in custody of the state pending a court hearing. Her mother, Dana, and stepfather, Russell Landers, 